Ari. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I've been to Railroad the last like two or three times and I've just been amazed by the work that I've seen here. So I'm honestly honored just to be able to stand up here because what I've seen coming out of this reading series has been fucking phenomenal. So thank you. Um, so I always like to read something new. So nobody's heard this story before. Um, it's called Victor, and I'm not reading the whole story, it's kind of just a selection of it, but basically this guy's kind of at a rough place in his life, like he's had an accident and he survived it, but he's not in the best of shape. So there's some like jumps in time, and I'm just going to say that might be intentional, so if some things aren't so clear, it's maybe because they're not clear to the... Uh, narrator, or the main character. All right. <clears throat> Victor. John goes to the nicest restaurant in the hotel, according to the concierge, La Folie. An immaculately dressed host seats John at a corner table. The tablecloth is whiter than white. He looks at his pinkish tan hands, and they've never looked as interesting as they do against such a stark white. It's like he's seeing them for the first time. He tries to imagine what it would be like to be a child and to realize for the first time that he has hands and that those hands can do things. Turning them over, palms up, he looks at the faint lines in his palms. Again, fascinating. These are his hands attached to his arms, attached to his shoulders, and so on. He's been going to dinner a lot by himself since the accident. He finds the private time in public, a welcome respite from dinner dates and small talk. The waiter comes over with bread and fancy butter on a small, whiter than white cup. Are you ready to order, monsieur? A few minutes, please. Pas de problème. Classy. The waiters even speak French. He looks to his right and his eye catches a couple dining. They are eating a lobster bisque, it's at the top of the menu, and a braised beef dish. They are speaking in the manner of recently married folks or newly coupled do. Their eyes are locked and their bodies are bent toward one another. Either they are madly in love or actors playing the part of people perfectly in love. Noticing things like this used to make him feel sad. His sadness had shades to it. On bright days, he would feel a light longing to replace the man on the other side of the table and have a woman look at him like that. A woman who would open her eyes wide, laugh at his jokes, cross and uncross her legs, while touching his arm at all the right moments. Before the Vicodin had taken hold, he used to sometimes go home and stare out his window for long periods of time, his apartment facing a line of other windows. He would feel morose, melancholic, and morbid at his worst. He liked to listen to Radiohead and Nirvana unplugged, albums that would fuel rather than mitigate his longing. But the ache has lessened. Still, his thoughts spin cycle his brain. Still the car, still the motorcycle, still the decisions that landed him in a hospital room, broken. Fear is the thing you feel when you're not sure what's going to happen. Fear is what you feel when the outcome is in doubt. Not in a case like this, where you know you're moving toward a large blue object that's going to shatter your bones and swallow you whole. A real Moby Dick of a car is the last thought that passed through his mind. And when he awakened, he couldn't smell the leaves or the wet beginnings of spring. He couldn't feel his nose or anything at all. Feeling numb wasn't so bad. Only when he started to feel things again did he long to make it stop. Dinner arrives, he eats the food, he completes a crossword puzzle, he ogles the woman across from him with the man. Lately, he's been making a game of categorizing women. Because the drugs have crushed his sex drive, most of the pleasure he derives from the game occurs above the waist. Women belong in two categories. The ones he would fuck, nearly all of them, and the ones he would marry, none of them. When he finishes his dinner and returns to his hotel room, he writes in his journal, women no longer interest me. I think Victor is my best friend now. No room for distractions. He turns on the television. He's placed bets on nearly all of the college football games. 
Instead of football, he's greeted with a commercial for erectile dysfunction. There's an old couple sitting in separate bathtubs on a hill. They're older than him. They must be at least in their 70s. They look happy. They must have just had sex, which doesn't really explain why they're in separate bathtubs. Maybe it's to show that even the happiest couples need a little space after a while run between the shoots. He meditates on his penis. It doesn't work like it used to. He needs to will it to action, order the proverbial troops to stand at attention. Penis pills are just about the only pills he hasn't experimented with. He still has some money left. He doesn't want to have to pay for sex, though. He wishes that a woman would lie down next to him. They could talk about nothing at all, spend their day in bed watching TV and taking showers. He could do that for the rest of his life. An understanding woman would quiet his brain. The commercial is finishing. An omniscient voice is explaining all the side effects of penis pills. The side effects are nasty business. John refocuses on the bathtubs and the old couple. He's never had sex with a woman in her 70s, much less a woman in a bathtub. A shower, yes, but he's never lived in a place with a spacious tub. He lies in the hotel bed and thinks about how big the world is and how many things he won't get around to doing before he passes on. He wills himself out of bed. It's time for a shower. It's his favorite part of the day. The best part of being addicted to drugs is taking showers. He writes this down in his notepad next to the phone so it'll be there in case he overdoses, and they find him. He wants the world to know that he's funny. <laughs> it's possible to have a sense of humor about all this. Sea world, drug addicts aren't just criminals who steal, rape, and murder. They also can laugh at themselves, see the world's an ugly place sometimes, and that humor is the next best thing to better drugs. Again, a little joke, but he doesn't write this down. <laughs> showers already feel really nice without a fistful of Vicodin. On Vicodin, showers are phenomenal. If John could spend the rest of his life in the shower, he would. He puts his hand under the streaming water and thinks about how many drops are coming down per minute. He knows that there have to be statistics on gallons of water used per shower, but what about drops? Has anyone ever thought to try and record drops of water used during a 30-minute shower? Because when he steps into the stream, water running down his naked, used up, hairy body, he imagines that he can feel each individual drop. And as impossible as this may be, training his mind toward feeling each drop pelting his skin relaxes him, and he feels good. If there's such a thing as a pain-free state, it's this. He has filled prescriptions from four different pharmacies. Thank God he lives in a place as big as San Francisco. It's much easier to be anonymous slipping in and out of pharmacies where they don't know him from the next guy getting his fix. He gets out of the shower and pops two of the oval-shaped white pills into his mouth. He used to avoid letting his tongue touch the bitter pills. For a while, he prided himself on his ability to wash down two pills without tasting them. He learned to relax his jaw and his esophagus so that the pills would practically go from his palm to his stomach. Now he lets the pills linger in his mouth before swallowing. He enjoys the bitterness of them. The bitterness is a promise. It's a handshake in the dark between two old friends. He imagines taking photos of the pill bottle on the table across from him, reflecting the scattered sunlight. It's beautiful. Victor, how are you? He calls over to the bottle, sitting on the little table next to the bed. He pushes himself onto his elbows and takes another two pills. The bottle says to take no more than six in a 24-hour period, and only to take that many in cases of extreme pain. He laughs, six stopped being enough years ago. Victor, just me and you, shall we order room service? His room is elegant. There are two full bathrooms. He never imagined that he could stay in a place like this. He walks over to the closet and runs his hand along the clothes hangers. He reaches for a white robe and puts it over his boxers. The material is cotton, it feels soft. He has never owned a bathrobe. He walks across the room toward the large window and opens the blinds. He sees clearly across the valley, past the lake and all the way to the mountains. The lake shimmers and moves against the clouds. He reaches for his iPhone to take a picture, frames the scene just so, and takes four snaps in quick succession. He wants to save them. It's important to him that other people see how nice his life has turned out. Except when he scrolls through the pictures, they aren't right. The mountains and lake are flattened. The magnetic sun reflecting and sparkling against billyless clouds looks muted. It's painted with dull strokes. He puts his phone down and practices staying in the moment. It's okay that he can't share it. He doesn't have someone that he can turn to years later and talk about the time they vacationed together in Tahoe. 
and saw Vermilion's sun, a fireball enveloped into the mouth of mountains, descending against the bluest of lakes. He sits on one of the two queen-size beds, runs his hands down his robe until they rest in his pockets, and he watches the sun as it slowly fades, its intensity swallowed up until tomorrow. The pain pills have changed his relationship with time. He doesn't care about it at all. One day is no more or less special than the rest, except some days he really does care. His chest hurts and he wonders if it's a residual soreness from the accident. He tries to remember a day when he wasn't in pain. He can't, he can't live without Victor. Why has he run out during a time when he needs him the most? He heads down to the hotel hot tub. Maybe the bubbles will soothe him. He slides down into the hot tub, his bathing suit filling with water and making a glop sound as the air bubbles fill his suit. He looks down and observes the patches of hair running along his midsection. He isn't normally self-conscious of, of his body. With Victor by his side, he is much better at observing other people in their natural states. He watches water run off the chests of his hot tub mates. The girls are trashy, as girls tend to be when they have a little bit of money and a bit of sex appeal. And the boys as well. They are toned. They aren't worried yet about their bodies breaking down. They probably have only considered death in the most abstract of terms. How y'all doing tonight, he asks, looking at no one in particular. One of the boys answers him in between sips on a Miller Lite can. Not bad at all. His breath comes out as vapor. Let me ask you kids a question. All the kids' heads turn to him. They wait for him to say something. Are any, are any of you local? I'm just here for the weekend. I'm trying to relax. Do you know where I could pick up some painkillers? Maybe some bike in? One of the boys who has been quiet until now speaks. My brother Jimmy might be able to help you out. The kid is all teeth, eyes, pockmarked skin. Looking at him is difficult. He reminds John of one of the hyenas from The Lion King. He looks like he's every parent's nightmare. He's the kid that does shots of whiskey and then drives home. The road a fantastic blur of yellow lines and shooting silver guardrails, light angels dancing on the windshield. He's the kid that gets daughters drunk and then gets them to stay in bed on the pretense that they are in no shape to drive. He hates what he sees in the kid. The kid has chlorine glazed eyes and a small mouth. John sees his former self. Where does your brother live? He's right across the state line on the Nevada side, no more than 15 minutes away. Can he meet us here at the hotel? The boy takes his time answering. He distracts himself by checking the dangling thermostat for the water temperature. My brother only does business on the Nevada side. He doesn't come over here. He says he hates tourists. His blood is thickening and his throat feels sore from the cigarettes he's been smoking the past few days. He needs a pill. Tell your brother that my money is just as good on this side of the line. If he can make his way over to the hotel, I'll make it worth his while. John hopes this will be enough. Dealers are always looking to push the product. No can do, my man, says the boy. Rules are rules, my brother refuses to come to the California side. But lucky you, I have zero problem going back and forth. Matter of fact, I like it. Way harder for someone to catch you that way. So how can we make this happen? John says, his tone is neutral as he can make it. I can take you there, says the hyena. I'm a good driver. John gives a nod of his head. What choice does he have? His stomach is clenching on its own now. His face is sweating. His legs are needle containers. They prick him from underneath his skin. And just like that, he's back at the hospital. There are nurses, sure. There are needles, of course. There are blood tests, urine samples, cardiograms, catheters. MRIs, bedpans, clean sheets, bright lights, dim lights, no lights. Family with warm smiles, children bearing cards written by children in awkward lowercase lettering. There are tests, but he never knows the results. The doctors and nurses are the patient teachers. They speak simply, and then they speak in jargon. He is aware for the first time how silly life is. The doctors are not here to heal him. He can tell from the minute he regains consciousness that he will never be whole again. They know he's going to die, and if they accept that they can't save him, they must also accept that no one can save them. He wonders why they became nurses and doctors, and he became a patient. But here, so close to what most surely was his last ride, he was overwhelmed by the shine of the car that struck him. It was so goddamn blue, a cobalt sky blue like the blue he saw below him the first time he tried the high dive at the pool. The water lapping against the side of the diving well, the perfect numbers on the wall, directly across from him a bold black 12. And he, only 10 years old, but feeling already that he knew more than he wanted to about the way things work. 
adults around him acting worse than children, hiding the world from him and relegating him to things like learning to dive into deep pools of water. Every day was a chance to prove something new to the world. He had proved to them that he could ride a motorcycle, he could ride fast, and that he wasn't afraid of death. And now, now he's on vacation, just him and Victor. He towels off and follows the hyena out of the hot tub, puts a robe on over his swimsuit, and they move past the workout room and finally out the glass hotel lobby doors. They are in the parking lot and they are in the hyena's car. The radio is loud and they are driving to Nevada. They pass the blue lake on their left and it doesn't look as placid as when he arrived. He thinks about how deep it goes, how the cold water could swallow him. That might be better. That might be a better choice in this ride. He quiets these thoughts. He has had them before and I'll have them again. If he can reconnect with Victor, the ride will be worth it. His vacation will continue. He can return to his hotel room and take another shower and then maybe back to the hot tub again. They are driving behind a car with a bumper sticker that says, keep Tahoe blue. John is glad to be out of the hotel. He's always liked the open road. It feels good to be going somewhere. Thank you.